if digital signage goes wrong, everyone's going to see it. That's the whole. It is signage. In the early days, it was like Windows ninety eight systems, and the amount I used to go around getting photos of like blue screen of deaths at airports. You know, you'd have the, the your name emblazoned across this big screen that all of your customers are seeing. And if that goes wrong and the the poo hits the proverbial fan, then that's going to be broadcast to the world. I love talking to an English guy, even when he talks about hitting the fan. It sounds so proper and nice. Keep talking. I am like obsessed with your accent. We have made so much progress and all we ask is an audience with you to prove it. Say aluminum. Aluminium. <laughs> The health of the AV industry, digital signage fails, and a VIX is throwing a party for Infocom at the Las Vegas Sphere. All that and more next on AV Week. This is AV Week, episode 657, recorded Friday, March 22nd, 2024. Vegas Sphere Party. This is AV Week, your weekly wrap-up of audiovisual news and information. My name is Tim Albright. I am your host with us to discuss the biggest stories we have got this week. First and foremost, Rebecca Sullins from EAVA. Welcome, ma'am. Hi. Uh, lovely to have you on, Tim. <laughs> thank, thank you. I appreciate you having me. Uh, Brock McGinnis from Nationwide. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Tim. Always a pleasure. Appreciate being asked back. Uh, and last but not least, the old has it, as the old joke goes, I just flew in from Orlando, and boy, are my arms tired because I got to hang out with Neil Flooster this week from Crestron. How are you, sir? I'm very good. It's so good to see you. You're looking good. I said it, I said it on LinkedIn. Yeah, well, I'll, say, well, I'll say it again. You're looking hot, Tim. I would. Well, you, 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 you are, you are, you, yes, you are as well, sir. It's um, flustered, man. Yeah. Flooster's flustered him. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll talk about why uh, Flooster is is hanging out in the states because he, as you can tell from his accent, he's from South Georgia. Um, he, he's from he's from London. Uh, he he and I did get to hang out at, at Crestron Masters this week in Modern Work Summit. Instead of flying back and forth to London for three days, he's sticking around, and he and I are both going to Enterprise Connect, which we'll talk about at the end here. I'm so, saving the planet. I'm offsetting my carbon. It's great. You, you, I appreciate, and we all appreciate that, sir. All right, first story: Digital signage fails. A global digital signage outage forced thousands of McDonald's restaurants to close temporarily on Friday, with a "quote unquote" out of service message appearing on order terminals across multiple countries. The company's chief information officer, Brian Rice, clarified that the the issue was caused by a configuration change by, made by a third party. Put a pin in that for one part for a second. Uh, and not a direct result of a cyber attack. The outage, which lasts up to 12 hours, significantly impacted McDonald's operations worldwide, with some franchises reporting an, an inability to serve customers for about an hour, hour and a half on some locations. It also in, impacted the self-service kiosks and mobile ordering. So this was a ginormous thing. Rebecca, I want to start with you on this. This, the, One of the things that, that the article pointed out, and Mitchell will put a link to the, the AB Magazine article, was the need for redundancy, right? Mm -hmm. What is a, the, the ideal redundancy plan here? Now, see here, this, I, I feel like this is a bit of a trick question, Tim. Okay. Because... Redundancy as we see it in technology means backup pathways, making sure that one equipment failure isn't going to down your system, whatever, right? You know, your, your network switch goes offline, you have a redundant network switch, stuff like that. Um, in my world, it's DSPs, you know, something fries yep. your DSP, the other one automatically picks up. In this particular case, that's not, that's not a, integration issue that was somebody you, you, that was somebody making a mistake and redundancy for human error is an entirely different thing than what we generally think about unless you're talking about live events and stuff like that um so in this case like where would the redundancy be except for perhaps in an analog backup right if everybody has um you know signage boards that they can put up or what but they couldn't even order so where is the i i, I I honestly don't know where the redundancy is in this from an AV from a system perspective, which is a weird. So one. That, that's a fair that's a fair analysis. So let me let me take a different stab at this. Then how do we not have this happen? Because he, here is where because you point out something very critical here, and, and that is this was somebody you know updating something when, when they I don't know how they messed it up, but they messed it up. This feels very much like. Every meme I've seen about the AT and T download and the, the downing, and then the week after that, you know, Facebook was was down, and then the week after that, LinkedIn was down. 
So do we not, how, how do we teach our techs and our folks best pra- and our customers best practices for when and where to update firmware slash software? Okay, that's a valid question, A. Eh? Um, you know, it, I think education is key, right? You, you don't want to update something that's going to affect tens of thousands of people in the middle of the day, which they clearly did. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's just sort of basic programming, maintenance, whatever. You can automate these things, and that might be a good way to sell control systems, et cetera, et cetera, monitoring, so that you know when people aren't using these systems, right? And you can update then. Um, so the control and monitoring aspect becomes really important here. And ironically, the last time I was on this podcast, one of the things that we talked about was the rise in binaural displays, right? Like, like mm-hmm. your Kindle, where even if the system goes down, they will continue to display that message. So maybe this is a case in point for going in, in a slightly different route as opposed to traditional AV. All right. Brock, same, same. I'm, I'm, I'm obviously hit, picked the wrong question. So I'm going to go the other direction on, on the update. Uh, a dear friend of mine, Rich Fergoza says you never update on Friday and you don't do it remotely. So how do we get into our in, in in front of our clients and say you know you whether it's a security patch or it's a feature update you know how do you how do we pr- put forth best practices for when and where to update systems It's interesting cuz this is the um you know this is that intersection of uh, AV and IT mm-hmm. um where we're actually uh, talking about IT practices uh, which I'm not an expert in um I, I know how to create uh, redundancy in the AV world um, and mission critical systems and how you have failover. And, uh, you know, they used to be mechanical and analog and now, uh, now it's digital. But I have to think that there are, are IT standards uh, about updates. Um, my sense is that, that the McDonald's issue was a POS system, not a digital planning system. Um, any digital signage aspect is is likely just scraping uh, data out of that uh, P- POS system. Um, I hope it wasn't because McDonald's was very slow paying their bills, um, and the uh, and the service provider decided. But um, but we have to talk about risk in every aspect of what we do. Uh, to the client, what happens when whatever this system is that we're implementing doesn't work? Um, Rebecca, I think the first uh, the first big stadium uh, system that uh, uh, a company I was working for ever did was uh, that they were able to get the funding for it because of life safety. Um, the uh, uh, the old PA and the way the old architecture worked. Um, they had no way of clearing 50,000 people uh, out of a building um, in the event of, uh, you know, we don't have active shooters in Canada. We're very passive. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but, but, you know, in, in, it, in other sorts of, of incidents. And, uh, um, and these are critical conversations to have with, uh, with clients because if we know anything about technology, it will fail at some point. It will get old. It'll fall over. Um, and uh, and so if it's part of the conversation from the beginning, uh, it can be addressed and you can manage the 99% risk, the 1% risk of some doofus uh, making a keystroke error, doing a, 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 a an upload. Well, you're right, Rebecca. That's, that's not going to happen. Fortunately, Crestron systems never fall over, right? I think digital science is an interesting one. I used to do digital science systems many back in back in the day, and it's one of those things you talk about mission critical. But if digital signage goes wrong, everyone's going to see it. That's the whole. It is signage. Um, uh, I think the redundancy is Rebecca knocking out a quick thing on her plotter behind her and, and an analog thing and sticking it on the script. You get the you know, McDonald's employees to put that out there. But I remember when we used to sell digital signage systems and say I'm talking 15 years ago. In the early days, it was like Windows 98 systems. And the amount, I used to go around getting photos of like blue screen of deaths at airports. Yeah, you'd have the, the, all the screens. You'd, then the, and our thing was, don't use a Windows system for digital signage unless you want to advertise, you know, Windows um, blue screens a day. And so we'd go around and catalog them. I think from a, an update point of view, there needs to be, you need to look at 
you know, how customer facing or how visual these systems are and then work out your update plan. If it is something that's kind of like a back office printer, that if, it, if the update fails, it's not going to be a big issue and you can work around it versus your name emblazoned across this big screen that all of your customers are seeing. And if that goes wrong and the, the poo hits the proverbial fan, then that's going to be broadcast to the world. So maybe you want to kind of check those out or have someone on site um, managing those and uh, making sure everything goes beautiful and smoothly, maybe. I love talking to an English guy, even when he talks about hitting the fan. I was being proper. polite. Nice. I was trying, I, I could have gone, you know, again, I, I'm, I'm obviously managing the audience. Again, I'm, I'm here teaching uh, Americans King's English, so uh, I'm doing my best. King's English. Absolutely. All right. <laughs> Uh, really, really quickly to, to, to clarify, uh, well, not clarify, but to uh, to um, define one of the acronyms Brock used. POS stands for point of sale. In this, uh, yes, in this as case. opposed it's to yes. <laughs> <laughs> just, just want to clarify that. <clears throat> Next story, Avixa says we are recovering. Yay. According to Avixa, the pro AV industry is showing signs of recovery in 2024 with the AV sales index reaching 60.7 in January, a level not seen since 2017. Despite lingering supply and labor force issues, the industry is experiencing positive shifts, according to Avixa, with fewer respondents reporting significant challenges and concerns about rising costs. Although the AV employee employment index has seen a slight less positive start to the year, it is expected to increase if the AV sales index maintains its current level. The robust U.S. Econo uh, employment data for January had 353,000 jobs added and a 4.5% increase in an average wage. Um, it suggests that the pro-AV pro industry is on the path to recovery despite the challenges faced by businesses in the sector, including the fact that the interest rates are staying at 5.5% as of March 20th. We are recording this on March 22nd, so just two days ago, the Fed did decide pretty much not to do anything. Uh, at least for the next quarter. Now, depending on which economic, you know what, look up your favorite econ economist, see what they think you're going, they're going to do. Half a dozen of, or half half of them are like, well, the Fed's not going to do anything for a year. The other half are like, oh yeah, they're, they're going to lower by the end of the year. And just like Weatherman and every sportscaster I've been watching for the last month, none of them know what the Bears are going to do in the in the draft. So, Brock. Where do you see the industry uh, right now as we head into, quite frankly, how, as we head into the summer uh, buying season and the second quarter? I have no cause for concern. Uh, you know, okay. we're, we're busy. Um, everybody I know is busy. Uh, I don't perceive that, uh, that we have supply chain issues at, at this point. And maybe that's, you know, because most of us diversified our range of suppliers uh, during the uh, during the pandemic. Um, I, you know, my my sense is that uh, things are pretty upbeat. Uh, I think we added uh, five new people in February uh, in wow. order to uh, to handle workload. Our uh, our summer is uh, our summer's booked um, in uh, in the Canadian market. The uh, the government is. Um, spending huge money on infrastructure and hospitals um, and transit. And those are two of the uh, uh, sandboxes that we play in. And so there's a ton of activity. Um, uh, you know, I've never understood how Avixa gathered its data uh, or what those indexes meant, but that's probably just my own intellectual deficiency. The, the vast majority of just really, really quickly to to have that definition. The vast majority of it is, is respondents, right? So these are self selecting people it, to, to talk in in survey speak, right? They are self selecting people, meaning that they decided to respond to a, a survey from Avixa, right? They mix that with you know uh, third party economic data, right? So obviously the, the Avixa can't pull out of thin air how many jobs was created in the U.S. or in Canada or any other company or any other country, so. Uh, but that's why the the one thing about the the respondent was uh, one of the questions was are you experiencing um, significant quote unquote significant challenges and this was the lowest time since 2017 that that question itself was not responded to at a high level so 
Um, Neil, same kind of question is, is both from a, you know, a UK standpoint, a European standpoint, um, but globally also, what do you see the industry? It's an interesting one. And again, I don't, I don't think I'll get in too much trouble for saying that obviously Crestron was a little bit of a poster child when it came to, um, uh, product availability. And I was wondering if anybody was going to address that elephant. No, well, again, I think we're all old enough and wise enough and humble enough to, to say, you know, yes, there clearly was, and again, I, before I joined, but there were some challenges. Uh, those challenges have been worked through. Stock is now uh, on the shelves and, and that uh, we are over that now. And it's kind of, that's fake news. Old, well, It wasn't fake news. It's old news now. Uh, there's plenty of videos. I did a video touring our warehouse uh, over in um, in Europe, uh, you know, sort of, again, showing people the, the stocks there. So that that's one problem was obviously around the supply chain challenges. And I think we generally, certainly again, Crestron, we're, I think 98, 99, whatever it is, you know, most product lines are shipping X stock now. Um, again, I think most of them, other manufacturers are getting close to that as well. So I think the supply chain thing is an old news. I think the other interesting thing, probably more so from the UC space and the AV space, we've kind of been in this kind of paralysis um, kind of area of like, oh, we, are we hybrid? Are we back to the office? Are we not back to the office? You know, and customers and companies have been trying to work through that kind of what are we doing uh, and what is the plan? And I think most of that stuff has, has hopefully been ironed out and nailed out. And that whole kind of like, you know, again, Tim, we heard about it in Modern Work Summit, but that the whole thing of, you know, getting people back to the office or, you know, hybrid. I think, again, most people have got a robust plan around that now. So, they actually feel comfortable then to say, okay, let's kick off that project to refresh this. Let's move to this new office. Let's maybe consolidate those two offices together into a new office space, which will then obviously as a byproduct, bring on procurement of new updated equipment, refreshes and things like right. that. So I think there's definitely an element of that from a, again, Brock and I can provide more balance from the North American um, pitch uh, being um, uh, from Canada and the UK, but certainly in EMEA, I mean, the UK has got our own challenges. You know, we, we had a, the, the whole problem with COVID, then Brexit, and then, you know, other economical challenges and a lunatic prime minister at the time. But, um, I think the UK is in, in a little bit of a challenging space, but certainly Europe, again, you know, some of the other big economies like France, Germany, again, are strong and coming back. Um, and we're certainly seeing more growth in that space. I wouldn't say it's a hockey stick, um, you know, growth, but certainly it's a pleasant um, upward um, linear trajectory. Again, there's no kind of big, big bangs. But certainly there are green shoots um, showing. Um, so, yeah, I think I'm positive about it. And again, you know, yes, Crestron had challenges. Again, I'll, I'll, I'll face the elephant head on, stroke its trunk and say um, thank you for supporting us and being there with us. Um, we absolutely thank all of our partners, dealers and customers for um, working with us and we'll repay you um, with innovation and product availability um, for the future. I, I was going to make a slight, you know, Amer dumb American joke, Neil. You, you, you said you know crazy prime minister. My question was which one? Yeah. <laughs> I was just going to give him the solidarity, like us too. Sorry. All right, Rebecca. Where where do we see the industry? I'm in a bit of a different um, mindset. <sighs> Because I work for an integrator uh, and have for a long time, and most of the projects that I work on are very large scale, right? So the microeconomic stuff, like um, getting back into offices and stuff like that, doesn't necessarily affect me directly because my projects never stopped. Um, in fact, you know, one of the big projects that I did at my last company was actually pretty famous for being one of the things that never stopped during COVID because it was just too big to, you, you can't rail that train in, right? So my sort of state of the industry is based on product availability, globalization, shipping, et cetera. And I saw some really, 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 really heavy stuff with that um, from every manufacturer, uh, you know, not just to pick on Neil there. But, um, but I do believe that Brock hit on a good point in that it's caused people to diversify, right? To go to other places, yeah. to look at other products, which I find um, to be helpful, um, you know, because sometimes you fall into the trap of using the same thing over and over and over and over again, even if it might not be the best thing out there. So anyway, sorry, uh, slight tangent. But to get back to your question, um, I think that the AV industry as a whole, I do see a lot more um, hiring people, you know, um, people need workers everywhere and people need specialized workers. And the good thing about a lot of the AV industry is it, it, it 
you can you can work remote, you can work hybrid, you can do all of these things, and we kind of go hand in hand, right? We need um, we need offices to have an AV industry, and the AV industry needs offices. Um, but it's a weird sort of um, uh, dichotomy for me because I, my work never stopped. Um, but watching the, the sector as a whole go back up, um, as Neil said, like a hockey stick, uh, I think bodes well for the industry as a whole because that trickles into my side of it. Product availability, people availability, yeah. more people coming into the industry, et cetera. Awesome. All right. Uh, final story, uh, June 12th through the 14th. Infocom will be happening in Las Vegas, Nevada, June 11th. Avixa has rented out the Las Vegas Sphere. Pause for a second. Um, I can give you all the details because I've been talking. I, well, I talked with them six months ago. I can tell you exactly how much this costs, and we'll talk about that in a second. But Avixa has rented out the Sphere for an event. Uh, it's the opening reception on June 11th. Um, it is the event will begin with a reception prior to the showing of Postcard from Earth, uh, which is the Darren Aronofsky movie created especially for the Sphere Canvas. Depending on the number of attendees Avixa is planning, the cost of the event could run anywhere from thirty grand up to three million. Uh, there was nothing at press time on, uh, you know, which which way they went. I, well, here's the thing. Here, here's here's the so you can you can rent out the Sphere for a day everything from top to bottom, you own it for $2 million, right? So 2 million bucks a day, you get the whole, you get every seat in the house, you get all the stuff, right? You get the screens, you get all the jazz. That's for the, the guys putting on YouTube, right? The, the folks producing YouTube, they're probably paying 2 million. They may get a discount. I don't know. But if you want to have an event at, with an existing performance, either, you know, postcard from the edge or for postcard from earth or whatever, you buy a bunch of tickets, you, you pay for food and beverage, uh, it, you know, the, you work out the deal. That's where the 30 grand can go up to if you buy out every single seat in the house. This was this information is two months old now, but it was 850 roughly U.S. Um, and that's without advertising on, on the outside of the sphere. That is half a million dollars a, a week uh, for roughly. I mean, depending on, on how many you bought and all that jazz, but. A 10 second ad for the, for the week was, was, you know, $480,000 uh, for that. So Neil, um, if you're going to Vegas and you're like, you know, the sphere is cool. I either don't want to, you know, go to the sphere or, or, you know, 16 K makes me nauseous, whatever reason you're not, you, you don't want to go. Or if you do want to go, but that's just one night, what else in Vegas is going to give us an exceptional AV experience? <laughs> Well, I, I'm a bit concerned because I was always told what goes to Vegas stays in Vegas. So I'm a little bit concerned about talking about this. You are so. entirely too social for that belong to you. So. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so what I happened didn't... in Orlando this week didn't stay in Orlando. No, exactly. No, it's it's yes, absolutely. Quite. Um, I, I, I didn't do I went to it was my first time in Vegas, actually, uh, last Infocom in Vegas. Um, okay. And I did a there was a lady who took me on a bit around every single casino. We marched around every casino. Uh, she knows who she is. Um, uh, that was quite interesting and quite an experience. Um, I didn't do the Tesla loop. That's meant to be quite good. Uh, if anyone's obviously looking for a, a marriage with Elvis, I think that's obviously quite, uh, quite a thing. But I think from an AV point of view, uh, I mean, there is a lot of AV in that space, um, and you only literally have to walk down the strip to, to see a lot of AV. The sphere is a bit kind of like it's it's a bit kind of meh, isn't it? I mean, it's like a big thing. It's a big telly, isn't it? It's a big round telly. Well, am I over? You know, I'm sure it's an amazing experience to go in and see it, but it's not. I'm not sure it's gonna. It's a big round telly. Um, so yeah, I'm. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not sure how sold I am on that. Here's my two cents because I have been inside the sphere. I've not seen a performance. I have not seen a performance there. I've been inside though, and I've, I've you know, I'm not going to call it 4D or 5D or anything like that. Just let, let's understand that darn near every one of your senses is going to be activated in some way, shape, or form. Right? They can shake your chairs. They can lower the temperature 10 degrees in three seconds. They can, you know, they have a wind machine. They got everything, right? They even have smell of vision. And yes, I said they have smell of vision. I'm no, not kidding. That's not the guy next to you that's just so, had a bit too much turkey or whatever. For for an ex for an experience, it might be worth it, right? 
uh, Rebecca, what, where, where else in Vegas, or just go to the street, where else in Vegas should we go for some really interesting uh, AV experiences? Oh, gosh. Um, okay. So, I, A, I will be there all week this year, which is a frightening proposition. Pray for me. Um, so lots of opportunities. I've been looking at going to a lot of a lot of stuff. And me, I come from live events, theater. Um, you know, I went to an arts conservatory. So for me, the epitome of, and this is going to sound a little bit weird, but for AV stuff is a lot of the Cirque shows that implement it as a, um, as a uh, supporting character, right? It It's like the sphere. It's, you're right. It's a big telly. Now it is a really cool experience. I'll give you that. But I like AV to be the supporting character and something else really cool, right? Um, like Ka was one of the first installations in America to do stuff like immersive audio. Like they have speakers in the seats. When Jonathan Deans designed the auditorium, he designed it for that show. There's a lot of really, really innovative stuff in those kinds of shows but because they're not front and center they're not the main point of what you're going to see like it is at the sphere people don't think of them right because you say oh i want to go to a cirque show you're thinking about people twirling around over top of your head not all of the technology and when you can sort of separate yourself and go through and pick through that technology they have got some of the coolest installation and live event hybrids in in the country period all right Brock, we'll end with you on this. Yeah, what do we think about Avixa kicking off the week, uh, kicking off their biggest <laughs> show, go into the sphere? Um, I wrote a, uh, I posted uh, on LinkedIn and uh, complaining about it, and then er uh, erased it because um, I don't always want to be that guy. But uh, uh, the Avixa's opening night keynote uh, and uh, address is. Uh, is a tradition. Uh, it is the only time all year that Avixa, as our industry association, uh, opens the doors and lets in as many members uh, and and people as as uh, are available and interested. Some of the keynotes that they've put on have been fantastic, um, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, often there have been awards presentations uh, that have occurred that same night. And I don't know if they're planning to do any of those things at the, at the sphere, but I do know that $125 a ticket will exclude an awful lot of people. And I just, you know, I know uh, within our own company that uh, as soon as I read the press release that this was happening at the sphere, I sent out a note to all our Infocom attendees to sign up because uh, this was wonderful. And then they went to sign up and bing, 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 the emails came in. It's 125 US dollars, uh, which is about like 800 Canadian or something. I don't know. I can't do the conversion yeah. anymore. Um, but, uh, but that's a lot of money. And that will, ex that will exclude a lot of people. Um, and, uh, you know, there will be manufacturers, I'm sure, that will, uh, and other exhibitors that will have a bunch of extra seats. Um, but, uh, but, you know, as unique as the sphere is, and as much as it, you know, it is the ultimate in backstage tour. Uh, like two years ago, uh, Rebecca, I don't know if you went on the Katy Perry Resorts World uh, backstage. Um, I did not. Which was, I was on, I, that was my in and out in 24 hours Infocom. It was a nightmare. Uh, that's the L Acoustics Elisa uh, immersive yeah. experience. Uh, you know, probably the biggest uh, venue in the world. It's, you know, it is state of the art. Um there's so many, there are so many cool things to see. It would be a super backstage tour. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I'm, uh, I'm concerned if Infocom starts making the, their keynote an annual gathering of members, a pay to play, um, activity. So, uh, no, I, well, I was going to actually, uh, I was going to throw it out to the amazing and beautiful AV Nation audience that if Rebecca and I, and we all are in, uh, Vegas for Infocom for a week, comment down below do the social media thing comment down below where should we go if you're watching this uh you know we'd love to hear from you i'm, I'm gonna actually stay on probably the weekend before and after i want to go on like a, a tour up to death valley and and because i always just go again like rebecca in and out you see the hotel the the convention center and the airport Sounds great death valley. I, i've got the, some better places for you okay well okay tim you give me your yeah. list personally but if you're watching this online in the comments down below give rebecca and i your uh your top five places to go in vegas uh because we'd love to know 
or, or maybe around we'll go together. You know. Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Because Death Valley is not around Vegas. I just want to okay. point that out. I mean, okay. it's, just, it's not like just around the corner. It's in a whole other state. Oh, is it? It is oh, a whole other it. state. Okay. Good. Brit- Which Brit- is like, it, it would be like, it would be like you visiting, I don't know, Germany. Cool. Oh, okay. Uh, France. France. Uh, France. I, I, I was about to say, don't say France because they can get to France in like 45 minutes on a we, train. We got a train that goes under the sea. Anyhow, so ABI Systems is a sponsor, is currently the only sponsor. It's not the only one. But they're currently the sponsor of that. Uh, we're owned by CTI. I got nothing, you know, uh, against ABI Systems. Good on them for, for sponsoring it. So, um, but yeah, in Neil, it starts and ends with Gordo's Tacos uh, is is where we're going to start. So, all right. Uh, thank you guys so much. Rebecca Sullins, how do people connect with you? Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, um, Rebecca Sullins. You can uh, email me, rebecca.sullins at ampthink.com. Um, and... Uh, Twitter. I think I'm still on there uh, or the X as they call it. Uh, I, I like to, you know, go and poke fun at Tim every once in a while. That's it's fun fair. for me. Um, yeah. So LinkedIn, Twitter, or email. All right. Mr. McGinnis. Thank you, sir. Uh, how do people connect with you? Brock at nationwideav.com. I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, I spend very little time on Twitter anymore. Um, Brock McGinnis there. Uh, and uh, I miss, I miss connecting with all the people. Uh, I wish that there was a, a uh, another platform that uh, uh, you know was more socially acceptable and and uh, <laughs> has less garbage on it that uh, that we could still connect. Although I'll still do an AV in the AM every once in a while because Mister Neto continues to do a great job. Um, yeah, he does. But I'm not hard to find. No, no, you're not. All right, uh, Mister Bluster, thank you, sir. Uh, how do people connect with you? How do people connect with Crest John? And how do we watch Crest TV? Oh, that's a plug and a half. Uh, crikey. Um, I've got a crikey in. Um, so I generally make a nuisance of myself on uh, LinkedIn. Uh, Neil Fluister or Neil Crestron. You can generally find me. I'm, I'm out there. Uh, I don't do the Twitter XE thing. I'm too old for Instagram and Tic Tac. Um, so don't do those. Uh, but I do. And thank you for that. And again, Crestron is very social as well. They're um, a company you can find. Uh, and yes, Crestron.com slash Crest TV. Uh, every Thursday, we do a, an inferior show to this one um that we put out um but we we try you know the bar's high from tim but we'll, we'll do our best to try and uh, excite and interest the uc industry uh but don't be shit don't be shy don't be scared uh, i'm a nice guy um so yeah come and say hi generally yeah and, yeah, and generally. you get to go to better places i'm stuck in the studio you get to go like all over europe yeah i'm in uh, munich in a couple of weeks and then amsterdam stockholm um yeah i'm on tour <laughs> and your mitchell job? has me here yeah absolutely i've got a book and a dvd coming out i'm sure as well so we're basement office in of Tennessee. Business, I'm just sad now. <laughs> All right. Uh, for me, for Tim Albright, don't follow me on anything. Um, they got rid of Justin Fields. That's all I'm going to say about that. Um, but go by the website, if you would, please, avionation.tv. That's avionation.tv. You'll find this program, a brand new state of control, uh, dropped today, actually, the 22nd of March. So you can check that out. Ed Tech, Women in AV, and all sorts of other stuff. And check out our coverage of Enterprise Connect, because by the time you listen to this, Neil and I will both be in Orlando. I guess I should be say I'll be back in Orlando, but we're covering Enterprise Connect uh, this week, the 25th through the 27th of uh, March. All kinds of really great UC stuff uh, hanging out. Actually, Neil and I have a a recording like like first thing Monday morning or Tuesday. I know we're hanging out. We're recording with Danto and some other really smart people. So check all that out and more at avionation.tv. That's avionation.tv. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you so much for watching. That's all the time we have for AV Week. The network for the AV industry. What are you listening to? This. This is AV. This. This. This is AV Nation. This is AV Nation.